so we'll, we'll run with that. Uh, can I welcome you all to today's uh, major talk committee? Uh, can I ask for apologies for perhaps? Colin? We've got uh, councillors Abby <coughs> Barrington, Wilson, and Rose. Can we have? Yeah, Mary and, and John Scott. Uh, also, I think apart from that, that makes up the numbers. Yes, of course. Second item is declarations of interest, and that's just for myself to remind anyone if you do have anything suitable, uh, either now or at any time during the debate, please uh, make that be known and we can fill out the paperwork accordingly. Third item is the minutes of the last meeting, and uh, can I move that those uh, minutes are a correct record of what happened on the 30th of July? That's agreed. Tony, do you want to ask a quick question? Yeah, it's just in relation to matters arising from the council for the last clarification of the age exception will be required from September implementation, just on page three. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. 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 Thank as quickly as possible 
and therefore committed to, uh, with Transport for the North, recruiting a chair of the body uh, by the end of this uh, calendar year, and also putting in place the interim uh, chief executive of the body to start to put in place uh, the full organisation uh, to drive forward Transport for the North. That commitment um, is there. Um, we are now working very hard with other transport authorities across the North to make sure that there's a plan that we're building the capacity and starting to develop the schemes uh, that the, the paper reports on. Uh, the first area is clearly Trans North, which is the high speed, in inverted commas, uh, train service linking the uh, core cities across the North, across from Liverpool to North and across to Newcastle, as well as looking at highway schemes on the same corridor. So how can we match the capacity requirements of the North um, in economic terms by putting in place that new transformational um, rail and road linkages. The second area um, of key relevance for us is about understanding the future requirements for freight and logistics, uh, with a particular emphasis on the connectivity to ports um, and airports to us extend from the ports. That's a piece of work, that's one of the work streams that Frank uh, and Darren are leading on behalf of the whole of the North, uh, and that's key because that's clearly very important to not only the North, but a unique selling point of have commissioned and appointed consultants to do and produce um, a pan and northern freight and logistics strategy, which will then feed into the rail and uh, the road work stream. And the final area of, of, of relevance, really, um, for today is the city um, connectivity package. So, this is making sure that each of those city regions and areas has a comprehensive plan, a city region connectivity plan, um, to uh, connect into those core new pieces of infrastructure. And we're contributing to that through the team uh, that um, we've assembled effectively within existing resource to drive this forward on behalf of both the Liverpool city region uh, and also uh, Trans North. I think the final element really to, um, to stress is that currently uh, we're doing that within um, existing uh, officer resources. Uh, clearly there is now um, £10 million a year available um, for transport for North to put that capacity in place to try to draw down some of that resource to ensure that we're contributing as well as possible by using a blend of our own resources but also that of our transport for the North. Um, the, the second um, area of devolution is at a um, city region level um, and, and the paper um, tries to outline where that process has got to. So if I just look at Colin and I'm sure he'll um, flick, flick through these so put some slides together to just try and uh, explain this. Uh, so the, the next slide um, basically reaffirms um, the government's commitment to devolution um, of powers and responsibility um, to um, a sub-regional or local level. Uh, the Queen's speech announced um, the draft bill, which is the City's Devolution Bill, which has been through um, several parliamentary stages and like to come back through, and as I say, may well be amended to take on board the transport for the North and others uh, subsequently. And that draft is working its way through fairly quickly through the statutory process um, and the government are continuing to re-emphasise their commitment to devolution of powers uh, to city regions um, with a change of government towards a, a metro mayor model uh, but also have done recently uh, deals with um, a deal with Cornwall which will be on a different basis for those places outside uh, of the city region. Again in the uh, statement um, the Chancellor issued in the beginning of July um, he's again reaffirmed his commitment to work with those city regions that want to put together a devolutionary package. Um, Leeds, uh, here as, as you're aware, Manchester already have a city to in place. Um, and Leeds and Sheffield have also prioritised alongside Liverpool city region that statement in July. And um, at the comprehensive spending review on the 4th of um, September, the submissions were requested for the 4th of September. I think it's between 25 and 27 different cities, areas, and city regions have submitted. core themes emerging from our package are quite extensive, so there is a summary document that um, the CA considered last week and then submitted, um, which I'm happy to circulate around for, for members you know, consideration and view. Uh, it covers these, these headline areas. Um, underneath each of these bullet points, um, there are a set of sub-asks, probably, probably correct in 70 um, individual areas that the people are, are requesting. And as you can see in there, uh, both finance and transport are, are quite heavy. 
transport asks, um, as the paper says, fall broadly into three areas. So the first is the cross um, river networks. Previously, the CA members have requested us to find out what the uh, implications would be of renegotiating the uh, debts associated to the existing tunnels. And that's one of the things that has been put in place with a view that if government were to pay off that debt, uh, that money would be available to the city region to invest into save in other areas. Um, the second area is to adjust and amend the existing legislation to give the combined authority greater flexibility on when it sets the tunnel changes, tunnel toll changes, um, and to whom those tunnel, those tunnel categories actually apply, uh, as well as um, as well as um, being able to give the CA more flexibility about future development of, of the operations. And one of the key asks is flexibility to spend the surplus that the tunnel tolls uh, generate on a broader range of issues. At the moment, it's restricted to things that support local transport plan policies. And so the CA um, is requesting an amendment to the legislation to allow um, that to be spent on uh, economic assets of other significant the second area is around the rail network. Um, the first area is um, about commitment to the special rail grant. So we currently receive approximately 87 million pounds from government per year on special rail grant. Getting some certainty of that funding between now and the end of the concession would make the financing of the new rolling stock more certain uh, and, and less risk free. We wouldn't be asking government for money, we're just asking for certainty and a long term projection of that special rail grant. Uh, the second element is about a joint investment program and a potential change to roles and responsibilities with Network Rail about the rail stations on the Mersey Rail system, potentially those on the city lines, and then potentially further downstream, uh, a greater role for Mersey Travel and the Combined Authority on rail infrastructure within our area. I believe that should generate significant efficiencies, but also improve for both the customers uh, and the train operator the level of performance. And that also is then covered about different ways of operating the stations, including the Lime Street, um, the City Lines, and the Mercy Rail stations, by putting in place longer term arrangements and a greater say for the client side, which is the, the CA and Mercy Trump. On local bus um, services, um, we've again asked, um, as uh, consistent with other cities really, for the ability to consider um, utilising uh, franchise powers for bus services. Um, we would want to um, look at that alongside the work we're doing with operators uh, on the bus alliance, uh, but actually enable, getting those enabling powers drawn down is one of the answers uh, should members that subsequently wish to proceed with franchising of bus services, obviously subject to uh, a robust business case. And then with that, we would expect all of the existing funding streams to bus operators like Bus and BSOR um, to be passed through to the combined authority to then fund any franchise or future bus services. So where are we on next steps? Oh, sorry, what I should have said is that the, the government are very clear um, that this process is not about uh, asking to fund projects. Um, it's not about asking for additional funding. So it will be in light of the comprehensive spending review and the reductions in funding that will be available. It's not about asking for more money. Uh, they have a, a, a phrase called fiscally neutral. Um, for, for people like me, that means that you ask for money in one hand, you have to be able to demonstrate within your package how you're paying it back with another. So the tunnel tolls is a good example of where that would cost approximately 50 million pounds to pay off the debt. If we ask them for that elsewhere in our devolutionary ask, we have to demonstrate where we would generate that amount of income back, back to government. So that's quite important that it is about a fiscally neutral package and it's about getting powers and responsibility and influence over the funding, not necessarily getting new so where are we now and where do you think we might be heading? Um, the CA sent a submission in um, for September's comprehensive spending review. Um, we've had a visit today, the Secretary of State, uh, Greg Clark, has given us some initial feedback on that package. Um, and we're now uh, working with the leaders, the mayor and the other um, chief executives as a group to try and identify the priorities within those answers and the process by which we can continue negotiations with the government. Um, it's clear that there will be significant negotiation and dialogue required, um, ongoing really, but particularly between now and the end of October and November. Uh, and 
we have to take a view on uh, the scale of the assets that we're asked for, it's quite comprehensive, and it covers a, a, a wide, wide area, a wide scope, um, and whether we wish to prioritise within that and what are the key things that are important to the city region. Key timing points, um, comprehensive spending review uh, in the autumn this year, uh, where no doubt uh, we will want to uh, build on the announcements they've made about the and then that will be activated in the budget in spring because that's when the financial year starts and that's when uh, any further announcements about devolution deals will be likely to take place. And the city's devolution bill is likely to pass through the process subject to uh, comments and, and queries by parliamentarians uh, early in 2016, which then enables people to go forward with their own um, order to, to change any constitutional issues they might wish to do so. Uh, and most people believe that would then be enacted and, and in place on the ground um, in 2017, uh, as we see here. So hopefully that's a, a canter through. Um, there's a lot going on, uh, both uh, at the city region level, uh, and the whole uh, northern agenda, uh, as you're aware, is really picking up pace across the beach with transport, the first um, obvious and, and key element of the northern powerhouse, which is being led uh, by transport for the north along with national agencies. Okay, members, questions or comments? Go on first. Thank you very much, Jim. It's really, uh, I think, three of the observations that have been in the past and that uh, have been directly from Jim and Dave, but I'm sure you can be very good to say it's not, not there than before. I don't know, we've got senior director level of being there, uh, my, my concerns. There's a very welcome trend to, to, to ensure that there's growth in the region. Uh, particularly in the A506 corridor, uh, as a represent that one, I have great concerns about the environmental pressures that are on there. That is an AQ&A uh, area two, assessment and assessment of the air quality management area. And uh, it's already shown that there's some concerns about uh, the distribution of different pollutants from the dock areas and that with the traffic. However, I have great concern as well that the correct measurements are not all being used <coughs> in that the measurements that they use are PM tens and not the smaller particulates which we really do need to be factored in. Coupled with that, proposals that are coming from that transport are moving to towards and I, I welcome this but there's a I think the person that I've discussed previously said when you get one thing here it's over the counter. <coughs> Is there is measures looking at the electrification of the rail the track moving out to the docks and increase movements. However, that would, uh, from what I've seen here, of course, necessitate the necessity of closure of parts of the dock road, what we call region road from the Liverpool side, and therefore we throw more traffic in, generate a great deal of traffic up into the area of uh, the A5 or the C6 track road and to the door. So I hope that rather than me just saying this. <coughs> Something that's recalled as a matter of four minutes. The, the other area I think you can say that I've been concerned about for some time is how we can implement employment uh, opportunities for people who live directly in that area, who are uh, going through the consequences of a number of change. Uh, I know that the figures I've, I've, I've seen don't show any great improvements, and those could be supported by the uh, statistics that no misprovide. To see that we have the, the, the general areas that are, are looking at the highest levels of employment. And the Linical Ward, adjacent to the doctor, the next ward that is Derby Ward, are those areas that are affected by the greatest, uh, the greatest poverty. And it's not just going and saying it, it's actually recorded as practical information that anyone can lift up that we have the most deprivation. So I just think that some way it's being missed, that's what's being missed at this. Um, the opportunities to be had that go to local people who live in that area. And the third point, I think, the, the logistics is particularly interesting because I think it does put some uh, new technologies in the way and uh, I think the opportunities that can arise from 3D printing could mean that there's less need for transportation and storage to wear and those kind of things. There will not be a complete removal of that, but I think certainly the advancements in 
the agency are doing a similar thing, uh, but actually bringing that together at a local level uh, in one place allows you to, to best manage that. Any further questions or comments from Patrick? <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, this question is about um, devolution and planning policy. Um, the a couple of years ago, the government changed planning laws, and we now have the national policy plan framework. And within that framework, there are three definitions of sustainable development: the environmental, the economic, and the social. Um, however, there is a perceived inequality in the weighting. highlighted uh, through Senate Council who wrote to the Secretary of State to highlight the, the, the perceived <coughs> imbalance in the relative weightings. It relates really to what Gordon was talking about. The impact on local communities in terms of social impact is kind of not as robustly um, assessed or scrutinised the way that seems to be a bias in favour of through viability assessments that seems to be a bias in favour Developer profits, landowner profits, uh, as opposed to the uh, needs of the local community. The question is through devolution, will we be, be able to alter the relative weightings within the national policy planning framework and the three definitions of sustainable development? Um, I don't know the specifics. Um, I don't recall that being one of the actual specific issues that we're asking for. Uh, on planning, what we are saying is to encourage uh, inward investment in the way that the city region would want is the opportunity to put in place one spatial plan for the city region because that gives developers more certainty. Um, I might be completely wrong, but then if you have that spatial plan, it will be for the city region to determine the weightings within that on which way the decisions will be made. So again, that would have to be a city region decision. But if that ability is, is, is put in place, then unless you're talking at a city region level, rather than a national level. Further questions or comments? If not, I'll just add my two panels before I move the, um, uh, move the report. Just to say, with regards to transport for the north, I continue to tip my hat to David, to Frank, to Wayne, to Darren, and many others for all the great work that they're doing on our behalf and literally fighting our corner throughout the, the process to get us uh, those significant improvements we want to see and we know we deserve. So, look forward to, to further developments uh, that come out of the process. And then just finally with regard to, uh, to the evolution, there's some, I hope, really good opportunities in all of this, because I think we would all agree that we here, the people of the Liverpool City region, have a much better idea of how local services should be delivered than uh, civil servants in a far off place called London. And particularly when we look at some of the transport acts we put asked, uh, asks we put in there, I think there's some really good, um, quite potentially exciting stuff if we can negotiate a good deal, whether that's a more flexible approach to Mersey tunnel tolling, that something would be more fit for purpose for our residents here, whether that's about greater certainty on over funding of the Mersey rail network and how we can improve that, and how we can get efficiencies out of that that we can then invest back into the railway, or whether it's the opportunity to frankly move beyond uh, the kind of ideological nonsense of the 1980s that was bus deregulation get something that is much more fit for purpose for our area and the travelling public. I think we've got some great asks there and I really look forward to uh, how those negotiations go and I'm sure that the leaders are doing that on our behalf really will be punching our weight and hopefully as the months go ahead we'll get something which gives us much greater uh, opportunity to shape our own destiny as a city region going forward. So with all of that in mind, if I can move the recommendation to paragraph two of the report, if that's agreed. Excellent. Next item is the Smart Ticketing Programme update for August, and Gary's going to give us this regular report. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, as you're very familiar by now, there are three projects making up the overall programme. This period, the overall programme remains at the status of green, so all is well as a general uh, Project one is around the concession of transport using smart cards. Um, that, for all intents and purposes, is now complete, and I fully expect that by next period that will move from green to actually complete status. Uh, so I'm not that long to say, as you can project one. Project two is a little bit different, that's uh, our transitional uh, projects, that's moving um, in the same way 
in solo today to come to the awards platform. Uh, as of Monday, the solo has joined the same way in being smart enabled. And over the first three days of trading, we've sold in the region of uh, 1,400 tickets already. Um, so it's quite a, quite a good response. The, uh, the same way it's also moved from being a today only product offering to a today or tomorrow offering. So that now is the, uh, the general passenger, the opportunity to purchase for the following day. Um, and there's now obviously some tidy up uh, issues and things like that we need to go through, but uh, that's another level of detail I'm sure that uh, I can talk to you about if you're really interested in uh, the session. Uh, finally, project three, which is around our smart ticketing. Uh, more strategic use and aims. Uh, that continues, we're still working on modeling aspects, linking obviously in the work to on the TFM piece, and considering uh, what's happening in that uh, space. And finally, we're also looking now, obviously as Project 2 has reached uh, some fairly major milestone, we're looking at what Project 2 can pick up next, um, whilst we're carrying on with Project 3. So, draw your attention to 3.5.3, on page 17, um, it basically says that we're looking at the different options, but likely candidates include products uh, for rail and for bus, and we'll come back with further updates in future reports. That's it for me today. Quite a light and quick budget. Excellent, that's kind of any questions on public score. <coughs> Silver Walrus. Um, I've got Tony, then I've got Mark.
we only reimburse for pre-paid tickets what we actually collect in. So although Smart Ticket may enable us to reimburse more accurately, the direct saving to Mersey Travel from that because it's in and out. Um, the concessionary travel scheme, where we also use Smart Tickets to, to determine the reimbursement. We, we don't currently reimburse operators for each journey. We basically negotiate a deal with each operator at the start of the year based on the DFT formula. The DFT formula includes patronage, it's a very important element of it, but it's not the only element of the formula. It's patronage and times by basically an amount for the further you think they've forgotten by being involved in the concessionary travel scheme. We, we are using smart data to help us negotiate better deals with the operators. What we're not doing at the moment, we don't envisage moving to until, um, well, until the termination of the current fixed deals, which, which are brand new, so that's in a couple of years hence. It's just paying them a unit amount for each journey. Um, This current round, so when I say them, I mean the two major um, bus operators where we have a three year deal. The smaller operators, we tend to deal with them year on year on year. But we are using smart data to inform that, We're using smart data to monitor it. Um, it doesn't directly drive the payment, however. But it would be very difficult to, to say with any, any, any definitive statement. But our instinct is because we've got much better information on patronage from smart data, we've been able to do deals with the operators that are well that, that we're happy with probably like over the next three years. I don't know if that directly answers the question or not. Um, but we will be able to do those analysis as we start to build up some 
I was just going to ask uh, as well, Jack, because it's great to see where we're up to. Uh, and then we start to look ahead at what the next ticket might be looking at the migrate across. Um, and as you know, I think we're all very keen with the kind of we only have one smart ticketing platform in the city region because we all believe that kind of operators um, launching their own smart car cars, frankly, will just confuse the traveling public and actually undermine smart ticketing as a kind of uh, principle. With all that in mind, uh, is there the potential that some of the operators own smart products will start being put on, on the wall versus kind of the next stage of a product migration? Uh, I think this will probably just get it uh, it's, it's not quite that easy to say yes or a no to. Um, there are some bits that are obviously possible, so technically, um, you can probably get a ticket on, onto there. I don't think that's actually testing, because as we talked about before, it's always a challenging piece to deal with. Um, where the operator tickets being on the board card become a little bit more interesting is because it's not it's not going to be directly into a scheme as then distributed in, in the way that John talked about. It's, it's a direct cost that belongs to the operator, so you'd have to set up different back offices, different commercial arrangements, and indeed would we charge them using our scheme. So there's a, there's a whole lot of new considerations that we just haven't answered as yet, but it's certainly one of the considerations that's going into Project three, and we're also should be able to do something quickly in project two. But I can answer that. Yeah, I'll be tough, but, uh, yes. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, really just to uh, emphasize what Gary said. So it's certainly possible, um, without getting into real technical details, because that's what we've got, Gary. But there's only so many shells. So project two is what we can do. Project one's hard. Project three is about a uh, company's back office solution. And um, what we do in the commercials and how that looks, what we know is that our one travel public or customers are looking for is something where they can actually um, identify and have one card for um, a one system and they can have some part of them. That's an operating project on, on the job rating project or on the two open project. Um, and that we feel has to drive what we do. It's certainly part of the discussions that we're having in relation to customer and the Sorry, and then. Yeah, it's, yeah, just to pick up in regards to what was said before about us going on the mystery shop and before, what I was impressed with as a, as a student of Hugh and Queen Square at the ticketing office was that the person in front of me hadn't even sort of asked in regards to the ticket itself, but they were made aware that they can now have, they now have the purchasing power to, to purchase for the day after. And sometimes we're good at, at, at and organisations are good at kicking people when things go wrong. But I would like officers to take that back to the people who were there because basically it was really good to give them that information to say, here we are as Mersey Travel and we're, and we're really, we are really concerned and we're always looking at things. So I'd like you to take that back and say I was quite impressed that they give that information to the people. Yeah. Thanks very much for that feedback, but we'll certainly take that back uh, and I'll see any feedback good or bad members have. Mystery Shop, we're just use the, the network, please let us know because uh, you know, we do recognise that it's terrible to have what we call customer experience. It's a good experience. Um, the pay point network is fantastic, but we don't quite have that level of control of what we are. And then the lessons are building on the work.